Um, my name is John Miniford and um, I've been translating Chinese literature of one sort or another for nearly 50 years. Um, I'm retired now, living in New Zealand. It's however been my enormous honour and pleasure over the past 10 years to put together a new series of books of Hong Kong literature, by which I mean literally the literature of Hong Kong, this extraordinary place which has developed its own unique identity and culture over the past 170, 180 years, which if you think about it is as long as New Zealand has existed. And, and I was urged to do this by my very dear friend, the poet and essayist, um, Liang Bingguan, and I always call him PK. And he is really the, the moving spirit behind this whole project. It's entirely um, thanks to him that it came into being in the first place. And all I have done is to try my best to carry out his wishes and to curate, as he himself put it, to curate this incredible collection of artifacts, literary artifacts that all stem from Hong Kong. And taken all together, I think they express the spirit of Hong Kong very powerfully, more powerfully than any political document, because these are works of the imagination. And they're works of the imagination that have only really been possible in Hong Kong, that strange, um, mixed, complex, um, deceptive city. We decided to go for six titles which cover the range of fiction, poetry and prose, by which I mean essay writing. This first book, The Drunkard, the novel by Liu Yichang, is really the landmark work. It is, in, it is in some senses the Hong Kong novel. It captures the world of Hong Kong in the 1960s, the world of Susie Wong, if you like, for foreigners. And it puts it into the most extraordinary stream of consciousness, autobiographical um, novel of the decline of a, a very idealistic, but terribly tormented intellectual figure in the world of Hong Kong in the early 1960s. I find it a very moving, and very um, revealing novel about the life of a writer in, in a capitalistic society. And in a society, in a society like Hong Kong, which is half Chinese and half Western, especially in the 60s, more so perhaps than now. That novel in the series kind of raises the flag, if you like, of the Hong Kong identity in, in literature. After Liu Yichang, really the next sort of chunk of the series is the two, is consists of two volumes devoted to the work of Liang Bingguan. I think he deserves two volumes simply because he's the person who really fought for Chinese literature for many, many years. In fact, until his dying day, he was still hoping great things for Hong Kong as a literary scene. He manages to be both very, very serious, very probing, they're intellectually demanding in some of his poetry, and, and then very light, very um, everyday, very charming in the great bulk of his poetry. As one of the critics said, it's like sitting in the back of a taxi and hearing someone in the front seat talking to the driver. The other book by Liang Bingguan in this series is, is, is a collection of two stories. And the first story, Simon and the Dragon, talks about the relationship between a dragon keeper and an actual dragon. And in this story, the dragon is a symbol, if you like, of the creative spirit of the Chinese people. And the whole story is a kind of exploration of what, what Liang Bingguan himself calls the absurdity of Hong Kong. But I think it's also an exploration of the larger absurdity, absurdity of the Chinese state. And um, it's, it's, it's an early story very influenced by Latin American magical realism. The other story, Drowned Souls, is a very late story. Freedom is, in, in a sense, the theme of both stories. But in Drowned Souls, the freedom, the liberation, is achieved by reciting a, a very ancient scripture. And in this respect, Liang Bingguan was influenced by traditional Chinese stories of the supernatural, what they call zhi guai xiao shuo. I think that that last story, Drowned Souls, 
is perhaps one of Liang Mingguan's most profound works. The fourth book in the series is, is a delightful contrast and deliberately chosen because it's, it's very whimsical, it's very charming, one might almost say it's very cute. It's a, it's a delightfully whimsical book about teddy bears written by Xi Xi, Hong Kong's leading woman writer, in which she combines her skills as a maker of teddy bears and as a maker of costumes with her imaginative reconstruction of key figures in Chinese history, writers, generals, um, politicians and statesmen. Whimsical book about teddy bears, which is not really about teddy bears at all. It's about Chinese culture because each of the teddy bears represents a certain famous person. The last two books that I want to talk about, one of them is a, an extraordinary autobiographical memoir by the uh, distinguished scholar Leo Li and his, his wife Esther Li, who herself is a very gifted writer and painter. In this memoir, they talk about how they met, very, they fell in love very late in life, and, um, and so it's a very, it starts off on a very happy note. And then, and then gradually declines until it plunges into the darkness of despair when, um, when Esther cr chronicles her own suffering from depression and her own four attempts to commit suicide, which is harrowing. It's a harrowing part of the book. But what's so extraordinary about it is that because it bears the heart so unreservedly, it also provides courage and hope to the reader. And it's, again, for me, what's unique about this book is that it's grown out of Hong Kong because both of those people, Esther was a native of Hong Kong, and Leo chose to come and live in Hong Kong later in his life. And they both are very much identifying with Hong Kong as a place. And they managed to bring together all these strong influences from both China and the West and break the rules, in a sense, by writing a memoir which is um, very deeply moving, I find, very sincere, very well written. Finally, the sixth title in the series is, is an anthology of essays from Hong Kong, which I edited myself and which I've called The Best China. Um, the Best China is an expression used in English in rather old-fashioned circles to describe the very best cups and saucers and plates which you keep for special occasions. But I've kind of re redefined it to mean things that represent the best in China, the best in Chinese society, the most wonderful traditions in Chinese literature, for example. Now, in this case, I've called this book The Best China because it is a very wide-ranging anthology of essays from Hong Kong from more or less the very beginning, from 1840, right up until this year. And what, it, what I hope this book shows is the incredible versatility, the incredible variety of the Hong Kong literary um, figure. We've included even some English-speaking um, old um, members of, of Hong Kong society from the late 19th century, because they too were part of Hong Kong. And that's where this project has been so lucky to have been able to attract, not just for this book, for all of them, an incredible range of talented translators, editors, and young scholars from all over the world, from the United States of America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and of course from Hong Kong. What we're trying to do in this series is to deepen that, to give the world, really the world, at this time when Hong Kong is the focus of attention all around the world to give those people a deeper sense of those hidden depths of the Hong Kong soul. It's an extraordinarily warm and human city and, and it represents one of the finest traditions in Chinese culture, the tradition of creativity, of free, freedom of thought, freedom of spirit, freedom of the imagination. These are what are the characteristics of Hong Kong literature.